So if you I'm Gar Alperovitz. I'm co-chair of the, the uh, Next System Project and I'm co-founder of the Democracy Collaborative. The Next System Project is an attempt of the Democracy Collaborative <coughs> excuse me, to begin to lay out in very specific and detailed and serious ways what, it mean, what we mean by changing the system. So one of the things has to do with finance and banking. <coughs> this report is coming out today how to nationalize the banks rather than try to regulate them and break them up, but how to do it specifically, trying to get on with substance. And we also have on-the-ground projects developing in many parts of the country that deal with uh, co-ops, worker ownership, community ownership, public enterprise in general. We're attempting to go both on the ground, <coughs> excuse me, and also simultaneously the theory and practice and program in substantive form. So welcome to this morning's discussion. <coughs> Excuse me. We have an extremely good panel, probably the best panel you could assemble on this subject in the United States and perhaps in the world. The experts, the experts that we have are leading experts in the area of monetary policy and banking issues, banking issues in general. And one of the things that's happening around the country, as you probably know, there's an upsurge both in theory, which we're going to talk a lot about today, but in the idea that the banks ought to be something under public control. There are public banking initiatives in something like 30 or 40 cities and a couple states around the country. Within the last six years, the bank, there was a banking institute established a forum on this only six years ago <coughs> promoting the idea. And we're seeing all over the country a very, very fast pickup on this. Uh, Los Angeles is developing, Washington, D.C., many, many cities, California, several cities, state, there's legislation pending in Michigan, uh, Washington State. Uh, you, you can check it out around the country. You go to the websites, uh, our own website, which is on the board, otherwise, thenextsystem.org. You can find it there. The, 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 the development of interest in the banking area is, is staggering and moving so fast. So the subject we're going to today, now that we've got our computers working, is probably the, sec the, the other piece of the puzzle, monetary policy and money because there's a revolution going on in that area as well. It's not simply the establishment of public banks, but actually getting down to what, how money works, a subject that has been obfuscated for many, many decades. A couple of good quotes about this I want to read to you if I can get them up, because my voice gets a little better. <coughs> this is John Kenneth Galbraith. The study of money, above all other fields in economics, is the one in which complexity is used to disguise truth or to evade truth, not to reveal it. The process by which banks create money is so simple that the mind is repelled. I like Henry, Henry Ford's quote. This one is even better, I think. Henry Ford put it this way. It is perhaps well enough that the people of the nation do not know or understand our banking and monetary system. Or if they did, I believe there would be a revolution tomorrow morning. Uh, we're going to go into that today, into what, what actually we know know about this and how the revolution is emerging very, very fast on the ground and also in theory. Our first speaker is Stephanie Kel Kelson, let me find my notes again, who is now currently Professor of Public Policy and Economics at Stony Brook. She was also Senate Committee Minority Banking Leader, the uh, Banking Committee, a minority top budget, staff budget, person. Budget. But more important, she was the key economist behind Bernie Sanders' campaign, so we're delighted to have her. She is also one of the leading experts in this field and getting a lot of attention, deservedly so, with opening a way not only monetary theory and monetary practice, but a way to explain it to the order, to the public in serious terms. Is your computer is it working? Yeah, it's a good Great. Good. Welcome, Steph. Thank Steph. you. Thanks, Scott.
to engage with you because, like I said, that's why I enjoy this conference. So um, I'm going to tee this up, I think, for the rest of the panelists here, and I'm going to try to focus my remarks on three broad topics, and I'm aiming at a progressive audience, obviously, uh, but honestly, I give a version of this exact same talk most of the time to conservative audiences. And the response that I get in those audiences, and it would surprise you probably, is extremely positive. So what is it about what I'm going to say that can resonate with both audiences like this and with a very conservative audience? When I say conservative, I don't mean socially conservative or anything like that. I mean fiscally conservative. Okay? So let me jump in, and we'll see where this takes us. Uh-oh, I've got to find a way to advance my slides. How do I do that? There we go. So as Gar mentioned, I served, uh, I was actually on the budget committee, not banking. So I was the chief economist on the U.S. Senate Budget Committee for the Democratic uh, side. And after that, I rolled off of the budget committee, and I went on to be an advisor, uh, economic advisor to Bernie's uh, presidential campaign. And so I just want to get started with, this isn't an attack on Hillary Clinton or Bernie, I'm going to pick on both of them just a little bit. Uh, but this is just to tell you the kinds of things that progressives are up against when they propose a big ambitious agenda. Okay, so what happened? Bernie Sanders runs for president on the most ambitious agenda I have seen in my lifetime. All right? And in retrospect, looking back, we see Hillary Clinton publishes in her book uh, this is a bit of an exchange that she had with someone who was saying, man, it's awful, right? Every time we propose something, he goes bigger. We say we want debt-free college. We want to help make college more affordable. He says, let's make it free. We say we want to make uh, health care more affordable and increase access. He says, let's just make it free, right? Every time we propose something, he goes bigger. And in this email exchange that is included in, in her book, she says, somebody wrote, said, this is like Bernie saying, I think America should get a pulp. And Hillary, the responsible, fiscally responsible, right, uh, voice <laughs> in the room, says, how will you pay for the pulp? Okay, so it's the idea that all of this stuff is so grandiose that it's beyond reality. You're out there somewhere, hoo hoo, we can't afford these things, right? So this is, this is what we're up against as progressives putting forward a bold agenda. This, again, is Hillary Clinton. This is from years before the 2016 campaign. And this is when she's a senator. And she's out there and she's talking about the reality of being in Washington, D.C. And she says, the reality is you cannot cut taxes or increase spending unless you can pay for Okay, so what she's saying is, and I've worked on the budget committee, if you propose to do something, you got to show people how you're going to pay for it. If you want to cut taxes or you want to put more money in education or infrastructure or defense or anything else, uh, you, you've got to show where the money's going to come from. How will you pay for it, right? And the Congressional Budget Office has to take a look at it. And things are supposed to be done in a deficit neutral way so that you're not adding to future deficits so that you're not increasing the size of the national debt. This is the idea, right? Everything has to be paid for. Okay, so Senator Sanders gets accused of putting forward a big proposal and not paying for any of it, right? Everybody knows that. That was the accusation. But that wasn't the reality. That's not what he actually attempted to do. He actually attempted to play by the Washington rules, which are you got to pay for the stuff you want to do, right? So if you go down his agenda, every item on the agenda, you could really draw a line from what it was he was proposing to the source of revenue that was supposed to pay for it all, whether it was Medicare, infrastructure, um, making public colleges and universities tuition free. If you actually looked at what he proposed, it was paid for in the conventional sense of the word. Now, obviously, if you have to find the money, as Hillary Clinton says, then where do you look when you need money? How do you pay for stuff? Who's got the money? Well, obviously, the rich people have the money, right? So it's a natural place to, to look when you're trying to find the money to pay for a big, ambitious agenda. You go for the billionaire class. 
or you go for Wall Street. Now you say Wall Street, will pay. Okay, so if it's making public colleges and universities tuition free, which was one of the things he proposed, the pay for on the other side of that was a tax on Wall Street speculation. We all heard this probably a hundred times. All right, so how do progressives, how should we talk about this? How do you pay for a progressive agenda if these are the constraints? Because this is the current narrative. You have to find the money. Okay, who's got the money? The rich people have the money, and the banks have the money. Right? So that's where you go for the money. It seems perfectly logical. But obviously, it's intuitive. You take from the rich, you give to the poor. Right? That's what Robin Hood did. But this means that you have to fight two battles. You have to fight for the agenda that you're fighting for, and you have to sell the policies on their own merits, and you simultaneously have to wage war on another front, which is you have to fight to raise the revenue. You have to get people to vote for the tax increase, or the closing of the loopholes, or whatever it is that's giving you the additional revenue. So you're waging two battles when you do this. My spending proposal is this, and here's where I propose we get the money. And this one can't happen unless and until this one happens, and you have success on the revenue front. You're going to fight buy, buy two fights, and it actually means that you are, in a very real sense, dependent upon the rich. Because you can't feed a hungry kid. You can't fix crumbling infrastructure. You can't provide health care for all unless and until you can claw some cash away from the people who have it. Right? You need their money. It makes you dependent upon the wealthy. So I think progressives should ask themselves, what is the purpose of a tax? What is the purpose of a tax? And if your instinct, if your impulse is to say, to pay for the stuff we want, my suggestion is you're doing it wrong. Okay? You're getting it wrong. This is something that, interestingly enough, a former head of the New York Federal Reserve Bank, can you imagine Geithner? doing this, uh, when he was head of the New York Fed? I can't. But back in the day, in the 1940s, the New York Federal Reserve Bank was headed by a guy named Beardsley Rummel. And Beardsley Rummel wrote this really important piece, 1946, called Taxes for Revenue are Obsolete. So what's he saying? Well, here's a quote. I, I don't know that I need to read the whole thing, but he says, basically, the need for the government to raise taxes uh, in order to remain solvent and run its affairs is completely like yesterday. We don't do that anymore. Why? Because we have a central bank and because we went off the gold standard. And the fact that we changed the monetary system in this fundamental way <coughs> opens up space for us to do stuff we couldn't do before when we had to find the money. Somebody says, where are you going to find the money? They're really asking you to like look on the, you know, if there's a pile of money somewhere, somebody find it. Or, like Robin Hood, there are gold. There's gold out there. We can rob the rich. It's, you're trapped in a gold standard framework when you're operating in this uh, frame of mind that money is a finite thing that exists somewhere. It's physical, and you've got to find it, and then you've got to go get it in order to spend it. In order to spend it. Rawl says, no, no, no. That's not how it works in the modern era. And by the way, modern in 1940. Right? And we still haven't caught up with this reality. So Rummel goes on to say the purpose of the tax is not to fund the federal government. The purpose of the tax is, well, multifold. One important thing it does is it allows the government to remove some money from the economy so that you don't overheat the economy through government spending. So in other words, taxes help you keep a lid on inflation. If you just spent money into the economy but you didn't tax anything back, you'd run the risk of overspending, overheating the economy, causing an inflation problem. Another thing taxes do is they affect the, the distribution of income. You lower taxes on some folks, they end up with more take-home pay, higher disposable income. You raise taxes on others, you take some money away. You impact the distribution of income. And you use taxes to incentivize or disincentivize behavior. Carbon tax is a good example. You don't want as much pollution. You don't want certain activities taking place. Put a tax on it. You want to encourage certain other things, like people driving electric cars. Give a tax incentive, right? The some form of a subsidy to encourage that. And the last one is, he says, you might want 
for some reason or another to have a line item where you can keep track of a certain program, like for example Social Security or the Highway Trust Fund or something like that. So taxes do a lot of stuff that's important. What they don't do is provide the government with revenue that it needs in order to operate. All right, so go back to this picture. You don't tax the rich because you need their money in order to feed a hungry kid or fix a crumbling bridge. You tax the rich because they are too damn rich. And extreme concentrations of wealth, especially, but also income, are bad for the functioning of the economy, are bad for democracy, right? That's the rationale for taxing the rich. Not because you can't do other things unless and until you can get money from them to pay for it. You tax Wall Street speculation because you want to discourage certain behaviors, not because you need their money that you raise from a financial transactions top tax in order to pay for free college. Think it through. Suppose you said, we're going to make public colleges and universities tuition free in the US. It's going to cost about $70 billion uh, a year to do that. All right? Now, to pay for it, we're going to put a tax on Wall Street. So every time somebody buys stocks or engages in derivatives trading or uh, bond trading, they're going to pay a, a small you know, a transactions tax. That's our tax. OK. So now you simultaneously have said you want to break up the banks. You want to make banking boring. You want to shrink the size of the financial sector. And you have made yourself completely dependent upon what in order to fund your education proposal? Wall Street speculation. So not only do you need Wall Streets to continue to speculate, but you're going to need them to do more of it over time and grow because of the amount of money needed to pay for college is going to grow. So you don't want to hitch your wagon to the very thing that you loathe and are trying to shrink as part of the overall economy. So, but there is a rationale for doing it. Right? And that would be to discourage certain behaviors, not to fund programs. Okay, so my argument is that when we think about government's financial operations, we tend to do so with reference to our own. So we think of the government as like a household. I would say, well, I can't go on spending more than I take in year after year and borrowing. I go broke. Right? Everybody knows. And so we think of the government like a household. This is a huge mistake, and if progressives do it, they need to stop it right now. Federal government is nothing like the household. Completely different set of rules the federal government plays by as compared to all the rest of us. We want to go out and buy a car tomorrow. We have to have the money in the bank or be able to prearrange the financing. The car is, dealership is not going to let us drive off the lot with the car until we have secured the financing to pay for the car, right? So what these letters here are, the, the TAB is taxes and borrowing. Okay, what we think is that the government prearranges its financing, that it collects taxes from the rest of us, that it engages in borrowing when it sells bonds, it arranges the financing, it raises the revenue, it has money, and now it goes out and spends. The spending comes last. That's completely backwards. What happens in reality is that the federal government, House, Senate, get a budget together, if the budget passes, there's an appropriations process. It is through the appropriations process, the budget authorization, that the government spending is triggered. That's how the government pays for everything. Budgetary authorization, or sometimes an omnibus, or a continuing resolution, right? That's what happens. We spend first, and the taxes and borrowing are secondary. They happen later. The rest of us can't do this. Money matters, and the fact that the federal government has control of the US dollar, creates it, issues it, is the sole source of the US dollar, can never run out of money. I said the currency, not other types of money things denominated in dollars. The currency itself is clearly, I'm not, you could try to create it, but you get arrested for counterfeit. You can't do it. You can't create high powered money either. All right, so the government's money is special. So how should progressives answer the question, how will you pay for it? It's a trap. It's a trap. Don't fall into this. Okay? Here's a perfect example. Here's a senator who is learning to avoid this trap. This is Senator Brian Schatz from Hawaii. He's put forward legislation for what he's calling debt-free college. He did an interview with Vox recently. They said, how are you going to pay for it? And he said, 
I reject the idea that only progressive uh, ideas have to be paid for. We can work on it as we go through the process, but I think it's a trap. And it is. And he's right not to want to answer it. It's a trap. Right? What they're really asking is not how will you pay for it, but who will pay for it. So the question is designed to get you to name the enemy. Who's going to be footing the bill? In other words, who's paying the tab? Right? Who's paying the tab? Don't answer that question. When it comes to Medicare for all, I think it's perfectly reasonable to say, look, we're talking about a sixth of the US economy. We're talking about a healthcare system that is the most expensive in the world, where we spend around $10,000 per capita. The next closest to us is Canada, at closer to $6,000 per capita. If we move to a, a more efficient healthcare system, uh, Medicare for all or something like that. We're talking about eliminating the middlemen and the entire apparatus that goes with it. It's a huge hit, I think, to the US economy because you're taking all kinds of economic activity and pushing it out. So, I mean, I've kind of half tongue in cheek said you might need tax cuts to pay for Medicare for all. Um, the, the bottom line is all this pay for stuff is built around the idea that deficits are bad. Dr. Evil told us a long time ago that deficits don't matter. Well, it turns out they do, but not the way we usually think about it. Deficits matter, but not because they add to the national debt, burden future generations, and all that kind of stuff to create an instability in the economy. Deficits matter because the government's deficits become surpluses somewhere else in the economy. And guess what? Dick Cheney knows it, and the Republicans know it. How do I know that? Because they just passed tax cuts that will add $1.5 to deficits over the next 10 years. Why did they do that? Because they know that when the government is increasing its deficit, somebody else's surplus is going up. And they know exactly whose surplus it is. They're using the budget deficit to channel financial resources to the people they're trying to help. And the Democrats could be, or the Greens, or whoever, could be using budget deficits to channel financial resources, infrastructure, real things to the people they're trying to help. OK, so I'm going to skip this. The national debt is a huge bogey. And this is the way progressives, it's the last slide. How should progressives talk about money, debt, and taxes? Don't repeat this stuff about taxes paying for federal government programs. It's not taxpayer money. This is the wrong frame. Don't talk about the debt as if it's something that we owe. It's something that some of us own. We may have treasuries. Uh, mostly they're held concentrated in the hands of wealthier individuals. And don't talk about government money as if uh, it's something that the government needs to get from us. They're the source of the money. We need it from them. They don't need it from us. So hopefully that tees them up to fill in any gaps in uh, where I was trying to go. Thank you. On, on the website. Okay. And he's also a professor. He's at Peking University as well. And he's also a research fellow of the Democracy Collaborative. Michael is probably has been on this for a long time. Michael, take it, take it away. <coughs> it's, it's good to see uh, the room so packed. The last time uh, there was uh, such a packed area, uh, when I uh, followed Stephanie, was in Rimini, Italy, except that was an entire soccer stadium filled with people just who, uh, who came all the way from Spain as well as Italy just to hear us talk about modern monetary theory. Imagine a whole soccer stadium coming to uh, uh, Rimini, Italy. It was absolutely wonderful. We felt like rock stars. We've never been able to uh, get such an audience in the United States. Uh, Gar uh, originally asked how he should introduce me, and I, a heterodox 
uh, economist or a Marxist. Uh, I think that uh, heterodox is a word basically to describe uh, people associated with Hyman Minsky, who himself was a Marxist. Uh, we had the same mentors at the University of Chicago. Uh, his mentor was, uh, uh, oh, I'm blocking out, ran for vice president on uh, the socialist uh, ticket, May Maynard Krieger, uh, except that was in the 30s uh, for uh, Hyman, and for me it was in, in the 40s. Uh, I grew up in the uh, only city in uh, the world that was actually a Trotskyist city, uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. So uh, my background uh, was Marxist originally. My uh, first uh, discussion of uh, uh, modern monetary theory really uh, was in Canada 40 years ago. Uh, I was the uh, financial advisor to the Canadian government. And at that time, uh, the, Can the big problem for Canada uh, was that uh, how, how, does it, how do its provinces get enough money to build infrastructure? Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about that because it's the same problem that the United States uh, is facing today. Uh, but you can understand it, I think, more clearly in the international sense. Uh, there were two ways of financing infrastructure. One would be that the government simply, uh, the Bank of Canada, which uh, was uh, more than any other bank able to create its own money, would spend the money into the real economy uh, for infrastructure. There was an accusation from uh, the, uh, the banking lobbyists. I won't call them the conservatives. They were radical uh, reactionaries and lobbyists uh, for the banks. And they said, look, if, uh, if you uh, borrow, uh, uh, if, if the government creates the money, it'll have to borrow it, and you'll have to pay 5%, 6%. But you can save half a percentage point by borrowing German marks or uh, uh, Swiss francs. This is the same position that uh, Latin America and Asian countries are in. Why don't we borrow US dollars cheaper than our own banks? So uh, the, re the result was that uh, the, the lobbyists in the, uh, uh, it was a right-wing government. It was Trudeau's uh, liberal government. And you can't get more right-wing than the, the liberals uh, in Canada. So uh, what they did was uh, they borrowed uh, billions of, Can of, of uh, Deutsche Marks and Swiss francs that were turned over to the government central bank. And what did the government did, do? Well, all this domestic spending in the real economy was in Canadian dollars. To hire Canadian labor, to buy Canadian goods and services, to build the infrastructure. So uh, my point was, uh, why do you need Swiss francs and uh, German marks if you're going to create dollars. The Swiss francs and German marks ended up in Canada's central bank with its foreign exchange reserves. What did it need these reserves for? Uh, when the, if the government is going to create the money as a result of this borrowing abroad, why, uh, why have the, the foreigners? Well, the answer from the banks was, you need the foreign banks as a honest broker because they're responsible. Uh, who would think of a, a you know, in literature, you think of bankers as being responsible, but they're really not responsible. Well, what happened uh, after 1979 was that the Canadian dollar went uh, down and down uh, from about a dollar six to uh, uh, in the 80s. The Swiss franc went way up, the German uh, mark went way up, and the result was that Canada had to spend 50% pre premium on the capital as a result of having the bank's work is the honest broker for that. None of this was necessary. The government could spend it into the real economy. The problem is, uh, you saw uh, the chart, the very last chart that Stephanie showed was uh, the government uh, uh, the government sector putting it into the private sector. The problem is, the private sector is not just the real economy. The private sector also has the fire sector. and. Uh, you're having, you can see today the ability of the government to spend money into the economy because you can see the quantitative easing. So $4.3 trillion is not money creation, it's technically a swap uh, of uh, good uh, Federal Reserve deposits in exchange for junk mortgages and uh, uh, the, the altogether $29 trillion of uh, trades uh, with the banks. But uh, you can see the government create bailout money uh, to create subsidy for the finance, insurance, and real estate sector. Uh, and this is considered to be non-inflationary. 
Uh, but you have to ask, what kind of inflation are people talking about? Uh, when they talk about government spending into the real economy and running deficits, they say there will be price inflation. What they really mean is wage inflation. What they want to do is keep wages down. So when they talk about <coughs> inflation of prices, they really mean living standards going up. We don't want that, do we? Because we call that consumer price inflation. We don't call that rising living standards. And the fact is, there's a disconnect. There's no reason why uh, consumer prices should rise when wages go up. And, and there's a disconnect with uh, the large, largest increase in uh, prices that we have today, whether it's uh, housing prices, rent, rents, as you have in New York, or uh, uh, me medical care. So uh, the, the government is able to create money now for the, uh, uh, the finance sector, uh, but it's being blocked by this patter talk of uh, you can't run a deficit uh, for the domestic economy. Now, what is tr true for Canada is true is exactly what Stephanie is explained for the United States. Uh, if the, if uh, what is the difference? in terms of spending into the economy between borrowing from the fire sector, uh, banks can create money simply on their computers, but even if it's uh, the rich people, if the rich people lend money to be spent, how is that the price effect any different from the government simply creating the money? The effect is exactly the same. Uh, and that, that's what they don't get, that you don't need uh, to borrow uh, to uh, spend into the economy uh, at all. It's, uh, it's a kind of science fiction story, uh, a parallel universe, uh, as if the uh, governments are somehow dependent on the banks. All, all this developed about 100 years ago, uh, when the Federal Reserve was created uh, in uh, 1913 and 14. Uh, before that, uh, there was a crisis in the United States in uh, 1907. Uh, the Congress had uh, maybe 18 <coughs> volumes of National Monetary Commission report. And uh, one of the volumes was by David Kinley on the, U the U.S. Treasury. And uh, Kinley explained how everything that the Federal Reserve uh, has done, creating money, moving around the 12 districts, uh, pumping money into the economy for the autumnal drain when you have to uh, move the crops, uh, all of this was done by the Treasury. The difference is that the Treasury was controlled in Washington. And uh, I have uh, on my website uh, from an Indian journal uh, all of the uh, documents of uh, how the Federal Reserve was created, essentially to take control of the money supply out of uh, uh, Washington and put distribute it over the, uh, the banks in the various uh, Federal Reserve districts, uh, and even to block uh, government membership on uh, the Federal Reserve Board uh, until uh, Roosevelt's time. So you, you have a whole uh, political fight between uh, the fire sector uh, and the government sector. And this you can only understand this fight by looking at uh, the politics of it. Uh, the, the charts don't help because the charts all make it appear as if uh, we're talking about a force of nature and something intrinsic. Uh, but you, you need a political framework. Uh, and I mentioned before how most of the monetary theorists uh, are Marxists, and I know there are a number here, uh, especially from abroad, uh, who are here. The fact is that uh, Marx uh, was much too optimistic about uh, the financial system. Uh, it's volume three of Capital was all about how finance tended to grow and extract more and more from the economy. Uh, the fire sector today, uh, essentially, funds uh, real estate, uh, it, it extracts rents. Uh, it, it raises prices by, uh, it backs mon and creates monopolies, and banks don't create money into the real economy, basically. Uh, they create uh, uh, money to buy companies, to buy real estate already in existence. They transfer wealth, but they, they don't really produce. And uh, uh, it, Gar's, I'm working with Gar's group to uh, re-describe uh, the gross uh, domestic product accounts. So we actually treat uh, the fire sector, finance, as a subtrahend uh, from GDP, uh, not in addition to it. But uh, getting back to uh, Marx, Marx expected in the late uh, 19th century that the historical destiny of capitalism, he wrote, 
was uh, to take banking and money creation out of the feudal stage, out of the medieval European stage, uh, and uh, industrialize it, and uh, essentially move towards uh, public banking. The whole 19th century was doing this. Uh, uh, there are three volumes of the National Monetary Commission report on the right spot to the large German banks, and how the German banks were working hand in hand with government uh, to finance uh, uh, industry. Uh, the Bank of Canada was formed uh, to create this time. But things have not worked out uh, that way. Uh, World War I changed everything. And now you have, uh, instead of uh, industrialize, uh, uh, industrializing finance, you've had a financialization of industry. So what you're having, uh, instead of the uh, government spending into the real economy, it's uh, starving the real economy. It's uh, ever since uh, uh, Clinton, uh, uh, President Clinton, uh, ran a budget uh, surplus in the last uh, years of its rule, you had the government with a balanced budget not pumping the money into the economy, as Stephanie explained. Now, what happens when the government doesn't pump money into the economy? That means there's only uh, two sources. One source, okay, is uh, international. You borrow the money abroad in a foreign currency, that you'll have to repay at a, a currency risk. Uh, and the other <coughs> source is, uh, uh, is, is domestic. I, I just blocked. Uh, is you borrow from the banks, or you let the banks uh, pump the money into the economy. But the problem is the banks don't pump the money into the economy. The banks only lend, uh, essentially, to, uh, for the uh, the real estate, uh, corporate uh, rates, uh, corporate loans, uh, they even make loans to corporations to pay dividends. The money is paid essentially, uh, the beneficiaries are uh, the 1% or the 5%. So the real question of uh, the, uh, the budget deficits or modern monetary theory is who is to get the benefit of the money? Will it be the 1% or will it be uh, the 99%? And the answer can be in tracing uh, the flow of funds and the flow of funds, uh, who gets what, uh, it will make it uh, uh, very clear. Who gets the result uh, of uh, the government uh, spending uh, in uh, forms that do not take the form of a deficit, or if it runs a deficit, is it into the real economy or the uh, fire sector? So I need you need to, you need to divide the uh, private sector into fire and into the uh, industry, agriculture, and in infrastructure. several times, who, who hear the word, the banks will create the money. And that doesn't ring straight for most people, that you can, that, that money is actually created. Now, of course, if it wasn't created, nothing could move. Or that the Federal Reserve Board creates money. Or that spend, the government spending creates money. Those questions are, are I'm sure, going to hang in the air and to which modern monetary theory has it has the answers. So, uh, but I want you, want, want you to understand that another way to think about it, although this very often this is we can get e easily into a trap about taxes here. But when the government wants to run a war, money does not seem to be a problem. It creates money when it wants to, and it happens to tax back some of it if it likes to. So, by way of comments, from having having talked to a number of folks on the word create, kind of gets in the way sometimes for non-economists. So let me go on right now, because this has not only theoretical aspects, but really practical implications of many kinds, including the role of banks, including what the government can do, including a whole series of other things, but on the ground things as well. Our next speaker is Pavlina Cherneva, I hope I pronounced it well, given that most people have mispronounced my name, who, who is a associate professor and chair of the Department of Economics at Bard College and a research associate at Levy Economics Institute, and she's led the way in showing very, very practical applications of the theory. Sure.
thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation. It's also my second time in the left forum, and I also enjoy very much the conversation here. You are all, I'm sure, familiar with the seven deadly sins. So today I would like to address the seven deadly fears of economic policy. Um, and mostly I'd like to address the issue of how to face those fears and how to defend a progressive agenda, whatever that may be. Um, the policy proposal that I've been working on for 20 odd years is an employment program that has become known as the Job Guarantee uh, Program and has recently entered the mainstream uh, conversation. A number of uh, senators and representatives have endorsed the program. There are lots of versions of the program out there. Um, but uh, it is, it is uh, a recognition that the government has a responsibility to do something about the persistent uh, problem of unemployment. So what I'd like to do today is basically address some of those seven deadly fears because as uh, the program has been discussed, there is a lot of response both on the right and the left, and a lot of it is quite alarmist, frankly. And so I'd like to ease our fears by um, addressing, uh, uh, addressing each one of them. So first, what is the job guarantee? How many of you are familiar with the, with the proposal or what it is? OK, a good number have heard of it. Normally, what I do is I, uh, like, I, I, I talk about the proposal and I discuss its merits. Now I'm going to hopefully give you ways of responding to some of the criticisms. So what the job guarantee is, is essentially it's a public option uh, for jobs uh, that offers decent work at decent pay. The public sector, the federal government acts as an employer of last resort, if you will, when people seek work and they are unable to find it. Uh, good work at decent pay, the public sector has the responsibility to do it as a uh, last resort. But it is uh, a permanent program. It's not just another jobs program that is implemented in times of crisis. It is an ongoing problem. The unemployment uh, uh, problem is an ongoing problem. And thus, this program is a standby option uh, for jobs. So it's a permanent program that is federally funded, but locally administered. Um, uh, it's voluntary. Nobody is asked to work for their benefits. It's open-ended. If you go to the unemployment office and you seek work, there will be a list of options for, uh, uh, for you. Uh, and the way we propose it is that those list of options will largely focus on public service uh, and the neglected areas of, of, of public uh, sector work. Uh, it's open to all people, irrespective of their um, uh, labor market status, race, sex, color, or creed. All right. So the way I think of this program is that it's an employment safety net. The way we have employment, uh, the way we have safety nets for various other problems, this is the safety net for the lack of jobs problem. So if if the problem is that you don't have uh, a, a retirement insurance, we guarantee it. We have social security. We guarantee um, uh, uh, income. Uh, retirement income. If the problem is uh, access to food, we guarantee that uh, there will be access to food. So we do this with a lot of policies, with a lot of economic problems, but not with the problem of unemployment. So this is sort of the extra step, the addition to the safety net uh, and guaranteeing the public option uh, for jobs. But it's also a transitional program where people essentially get their starter jobs if they need to, or they get their stepping stone, they enter into this program, and then transition out of it if they so desire. Okay, so let's discuss the fears. Um, the one that perhaps is the first one that we normally have to address is the one that Stephanie and Michael addressed. That is the fear of spending. That is the fear uh, of money, really. It's based on a deep understanding of on a deep misunderstanding of what money is and what what it does. So again, you know, Stephanie explained how uh, normally there are these images that are conjured in our mind that 
gee, you know, my hard-earned money, I've been saving it, and now the government wants to tax it away from me so that they can pay for these policies, and who knows if they're going to be good or bad, and we just need to give up this myth of the taxpayer money because this is not how actually public, the public sector spends. So that myth was debunked um, already. I'm not going to spend too much uh, time on it, but I want to add one other purpose of taxes to the list that Stephanie um, uh, provided. And the other purpose of taxes is that taxes create demand for money. Taxes create demand for the dollar in a sense. Just think of it this way. If the government tomorrow decided uh, to tax you in Canadian dollars, right? on April 15, you have to deliver Canadian dollars or euros, what will you ask your employer to pay you? Will you ask them for dollars or will you ask them for euros? So the, the tax in this kind of coercive way, if you will, creates demand for the very thing that the government issues, the dollar. And the reason is because the government needs to be able to spend something that we value to be able to, to fulfill its, its various public service objectives, public objectives, okay? So, so here's, here's one way of thinking about it. The public sector, the, the government, is the monopoly issuer of the dollar. The only source of the dollar. The dollar comes from the federal government. It is the ultimate source of dollars. Unemployment, in a way, is people seeking dollars but not able to find them. And so, whatever the other arguments for addressing the problem of unemployment, and we can discuss them, there is one key aspect to this problem is that there's only one sector that can actually choke up the demand for dollars. There's only one sector that can actually uh, provide it to those who need it, and that is the public sector. Another piece to the story is that the unemployed are already in the public sector. We are, the, the government is already responsible for uh, the unemployed, we do the right thing. We, you know, we provide unemployment insurance as inadequate as it might be. We provide various other income support, even though those programs are also sort of underfunded. But we, we have this uh, understanding that we have to provide for people who don't have, um, you know, access to decent employment or decent incomes. Uh, and so we provide a, a slew of programs, but we don't provide the one that that many people need, and that is uh, employment. So we are not only responsible for the unemployed, but we also bear the costs of unemployment, underemployment, poverty that are not the financial costs. Right? All of the, you know, if you think of virtually all social economic, political problems in one way or another, they're connected to uh, communities that have lost their economic life, people who have lost economic opportunities, and the distress that families feel not being able to provide for themselves. Um, these are large, invisible, but very real costs that we already bear. So, um, so the fear of spending uh, is the first fear that we need to debunk. By, and I, I, this is a bit of a, maybe an esoteric point, but I want to put it out there. If the government sector is the monopoly issuer of the currency, and it provides the currency in exchange for employment in the public sector, public sector work, then that, there is an exchange. We, we establish some sort of baseline value for that currency. We anchor the value of the currency in labor power. We know exactly what it's worth. It is worth $10, $15 are worth one hour of publicly useful labor. And so we, in a sense, it's kind of our gold standard, right? But it uses not gold, but it uses labor to anchor the value of the currency. All right, so the next fear is the fear of inflation. Uh, and I think that that is really the fear of big numbers. Because when we estimate what a job guarantee would cost, we come up, and by we I mean uh, uh, my colleagues, including Stephanie, Randy, Gray, Scott Folion, we have a proposal um, that you can find at the Living Institute um, uh, website uh, that estimates what a job guarantee would cost. 
and we talk about the financial cost. So we come up with between 300, 500 billion a year to employ 15 million, million people. And a lot of people have said, oh gee, this is an enormous program, it's going to be very inflationary. Is $300 billion really inflationary? The Department of Defense, including the war budget, is about $900 billion a year. Social Security is upwards of $1 trillion a year. Medicare, Medicaid, um, Medicare is $700 billion. Medicaid is, nine, uh, is uh, $600 billion. That was a little more, actually. In either case, we understand that these are important programs, right? We understand that Social Security is an important program. We fund it. Right? And there's no fear of big numbers there. But somehow $300 billion is supposed to generate this massive inflation that will erode the value of the currency. But as Michael pointed out, this is not really the problem. It's just the government is going to drop a whole bunch of money on the economy to generate economic activity. A lot of people are actually worried um, that it's, it might actually push up wages, that it might actually provide wages at a decent living level right, that pay well. And, um, and we understand that the job guarantee will be the effective minimum wage for the economy. So why would you work for $7 an hour if there's a public option at 15? The private employer has to match this. And so um, we have modeled this, and we find negligible impact of this a very bold program uh, on inflation. But the other thing that virtually everybody misses in this discussion is that a one-time adjustment in prices and wages across the economy, across the board, is not inflationary. Inflation is when prices keep going up. And if the wage goes up from 15 to 16 to 20 to 25 to 30, to, then the private sector will have to match it. Yes, that will be inflationary, but no, we are anchoring the floor. We are raising the floor and we are anchoring it at 15. And the second piece that everybody misses is that the job guarantee actually shrinks when the economy is growing. When the economy is growing, when private employment is growing, when there are quote unquote inflationary pressures in the economy, the program shrinks. So actually it's a dampening effect on inflation, not a fueling effect to inflation. There's a fear of big government, of course, but most people ignore the fact that we already have big government. And what I already pointed out is that government has devotes an enormous amount of financial and real resources to deal with the fallout from unemployment, underemployment, and poverty. Um, so in this sense, the way to think about this is that, un that the job guarantee actually reduces the cost of unemployment. Okay. It, um, one moment, uh, it already, it doesn't just reduce the financial cost of, of uh, other program, anti-poverty programs, but actually the real cost of uh, uh, unemployment. Um, <coughs> We, um, I think here what I want to uh, point out is that whatever you discuss, whatever your policy uh, priority is, always separate the financial cost from the real cost. When you talk, or when you defend social security, don't fall into the trap of, of this discussion, like how will we pay for it? The question is, you know, what would we do with a whole bunch of people who are retiring who don't have the goods and services that they might require to live a decent life. It is not a matter of financially providing for them, but providing for them in real resources. And it's the same thing with unemployment. It's not the problem of paying for unemployment, but the problem is, do we really want to maintain this paradigm of neglect, of, a, you know, of uh, abandoning our public uh, spaces, of abandoning our public purpose, of allowing people to suffer uh, all the consequences that come with unemployment? Okay. There's also the fear administra of administrative burden, and this is a unique double standard that the job guarantee faces. We never hear, we can't go to war, we can't engage in nation building because it's going to be an administrative nightmare, right? Um, but the job guarantee uses the existing institutional infrastructure to uh, simply expand the, the number of jobs out there. Is it really so difficult to employ 15 million people? I and mean, is this really the biggest problem that the government is facing? Well, public education serves 50 million students. Nobody is saying we've got to take it away because it's an administrative nightmare, right? Um, Social Security, 56, 56 million people. Medicare, 44 million. Medicaid, 70 million. Yeah, it's easy to send a check, but all of this involves a fair amount of administration. 
right? And we don't we don't discuss these. Um, I still have two more fears. Fear of boondoggles, right? This was the fear during the New Deal that somehow the government is going to, you know, create bad jobs. Well, just go to the Living New Deal map, and you will find what we did and the legacy that we left. Fear of waste. Oh, gee, you know, it's just boondoggles, right? That's sort of an extension of, of, of that argument. Don't fall into the trap of the productivity. You know, it's, it's, it's a, a, the, you know, what's the productivity of these jobs? It's a natural impulse to say, but what will people really do? And I can give you a very long list of what they can do, good, useful jobs. But the way to answer this question is, what is the productivity of the unemployed today? Right? There's a negative productivity. You know, you have malnourished children that go to school because their parents don't have income to provide for them. That is the productivity you are wondering, and you need to be focusing on. Yes, there are people who are arguing, even on the left, that artists and actors are really not productive jobs. We disagree. We believe that we have to support even those things that are not sold for profit. All right. And finally, the fear of political revolution. This was raised by Robert Samuelson in the Washington Post. And he says, imagine people who work in the private sector who suddenly realize the public option provides Medicare and child care, and they don't have it. This is going to be enormously disruptive to the business as usual model. Right? Well, look, in, in IT, disruptions are considered great, right? Progressive. But in public policy, disruptions are awful, terrible, right? So this is a defense of the status quo. It is a defense of a model where firms are only profitable when they pay poverty wages. We don't want to defend this model. We want to disrupt it. Finally, I think all of this amounts to fear of change, but, but Americans are not really so afraid of it because uh, a recent survey showed that the job guarantee had overwhelming support, and even in deep red states, 70, oh, upwards of 70% of, of respondents supported it. And the last slide is the great expectations. Those of us that have been working on this project are very encouraged, excited that it is in the mainstream, but my cautionary note is that we put way too much on the shoulders of the job guarantee. We have had decades of neglect of the public sector. We have enormous environmental challenges. And we are suddenly putting all of these problems on the shoulders of the job and saying, hey, look, see, this is the program that will solve these problems. It will not. This program provides jobs for all. This program helps the progressive agenda. It's a very crucial piece of the progressive agenda. We can, we can have countless of green jobs that we can do, but we need so much more than that. Um, we can help the fight for 15 because that's what our wage is. We can, pay, we can establish a paid leave for all because that's the public option. We can establish childcare, Medicare because that's the standard of pay. So once we shed the uh, seven deadly fears, the only remaining question is, if not now, when? <laughs>
my name is Raul Carrillo. This is my first time presenting at Left Forum. Long time listener, first time caller. Um, so what I'm going to try to do is, depending on your opinion, synthesize or bastardize some of the ideas that were just uh, presented by three of my heroes here, and articulate those in a language that is useful, I think, to organizers, to activists, to people who are in this shitty economy, trying to heal the wounds, trying to take care of other people, trying to actually introduce some of these intellectual paradigms to work on the ground. I'm particularly going to focus on two movements that I'm a part of. The first is the modern money movement. I think we can call it a movement now. We've got a lot of energy. Maybe it's an intellectual movement. Maybe it's not an entire social movement yet. But we're getting there. And I'm affiliated with a number of modern money organizations, but principally the Modern Money Network, which um, a few of us started several years ago when we were law students at Columbia and met up with activists, some of whom are in the room today. And we started thinking, how does this kernel of what we consider to be factually correct analysis of the economy, MMT, connect to the law, connect to organizing, connect to technology, connect to all these other things? How can we build bridges? How can we create packages that are useful for activists and organizers to use? And over the last five years or so, we've held about 70 symposia in the United States, in the UK, in Germany, in Australia, in Brazil, and a few other places trying to connect MMT to other things. So that's one hat I'm wearing. The other one is that I work for the New Economy Project, which is a about 20-year-old nonprofit here in, uh, in New York City. And we do two things. One is we fight corporate power. I personally operate a financial justice hotline where folks can call um, when they have problems with banks, debt collectors, landlords, etc. They come to the office. We try to help them out on a very individual level. We also bring some impact litigation. The second thing that we do is community economic development. We try to build community land trusts financial cooperatives, worker co-ops, all the good stuff that I know a lot of people in the audience are involved in already. So, um, you've heard what MMT is. What is the new economy movement? Here is a quote by our dear moderator, Estrell Perevitz, written in The Nation in 2011. The essential idea is we're trying to move out of capitalism, but we have a very, very strong focus on environmental sustainability. The production system, um, with fire on top of it, as Michael mentioned, is cooking us. How do we get out of here? New Economy Project has a particular focus on something called the Just Transition, which arose in the 80s and 90s. And the idea here is that we don't just want to go to an economy that's more sustainable. Along the way, we want to heal some of the wounds that have been caused. We want to help people who face the biggest threats from ecological disaster. That means a particular focus on racial justice, gender justice, all the various forms of social justice that need to come along with the push to an environmentally sustainable world. Here I have two quotes from two organizations, one that we work with called UPROSE, which is a Puerto Rican uh, community-based organization in Sunset Park that is both trying to defend the community here and lead to a just recovery in Puerto Rico. The second um, little letter over here is really just a point of personal pride. I am from New Mexico. That is a letter from a group called the Southwest Organizing Project, obviously, a bunch of environmentalists of color in 1990 to the Sierra Club, saying, please stop outsourcing your waste and dumping it over here. Please stop uh, destroying native land title claims. Just because you know white people have the science and have understood now that things are going wrong and they control the media, it doesn't mean that they can you know, push the problem onto us when we are the most vulnerable populations. It's not new. It's a feature of the system. You can see it happening today. There's a Nation article that's very good on this. I think you'll find the numbers quite shocking. Environmental racism is a feature, not a bug of capitalism. How does MMT help? How does all this stuff that Stephanie was talking about, that Michael was talking about, that Pavlina was talking about, help us get there? I'm actually going to borrow a quote from one of the organizers of this panel, this joke winner from the Next System Project, who may be in the audience. What MMT and PK theory does is it concentrates our minds on the real limits, on the real things that we need to make more sustainable. And that means we're focusing, again, it's been mentioned several times, we're focusing on the real, what's happening to people, what's happening to communities, what's happening to the planet, 
when we're talking about an economy without limits, money is not necessarily, or an economy with limits, money is not necessarily the enemy. In fact, a lot of MNTers agree. This is a quote from uh, the Benzagra Institute um, by my dear friend uh, Fidel Kabu, who often says, our economy runs on waste now. One of the fears, fear of waste for the job guarantee, fear of MT, fear of financial waste, fear of fiscal waste. That's nothing. We make that stuff. It's a legal construct. It's a social construct. What's really the problem is when money is used to burn up the planet. This is a metaphor from a environmental justice group in Oakland called the Movement Generation Justice and Ecology Project. This is how they describe the process that the industrial production system applies to our planet and thus to us. We dig up resources, we burn them, then we dump the waste. We churn it up. This is terrible. It's killing us. We already know this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take this metaphor and I'm going to say that not only does the industrial production system do this to nature, but the financial system does this to people. Fire burns people. It's right there in the, right there in the name. And of course, the way that the, the system treats the planet is the way that you know, the system treats people. There are lots of traditions, uh, leftist, post-colonial, that talk a lot about this. I think I don't need to repeat that or go into, the, into depth on that point here for this audience. So what does the fire system do? It converts a participant in the economy, you or I, whether in our capacity as a worker, a tenant, a borrower, a debtor of some sort, and it turns us into non-renewable participants. It treats us like it can draw money out of us and then discard us, whether that's in a place of employment, whether that's in the, finance, in the credit system, wherever it is, it operates on the logic of austerity, but not only that, on the logic of extraction. We are resources. We try to get profits out. Again, these should be things that are comfortable um, for leftists to state <laughs> in rooms like these. It treats us like we're disposable. We are waste. How did we get here? Again, there are lots of different leftist stories on how this is done, but I think that MMT adds a particular element to this. So we all know the story of enclosure, property rights, etc. People become dispossessed, they become part of a labor force that is roving, you don't have property, etc. But something special has happened. Michael talked about the existence of the fire sector in relation to the production sector. We can't work just for biophysical resources. We can't just find some land and you know grow some food, even if we wanted to. We have to pay taxes. And t by taxes, I think I mean something broadly. We talk about taxes in a strict sense sometimes with MMT. What we really mean is any kinds of fines, fees, obligations from the state. That means the fees you get for walking while black in Ferguson. That means you know student loan interest. That means a wide variety of things. But the point is, the system is set up so that we have to get money, and people take advantage of that. So now capitalists are not only trying to control the means of production, they're trying to control the means of the means of production, the fire system, as well as the industrial production system. Why does this myth persist? Why does, excuse me, why does it, how does this system keep going? It acts like the money comes from the users, from the resources that are being used rather than from the system itself. We talked about the taxpayer money frame, how that's particularly harmful. When you think that the money to keep the machine running has to be extracted from people, you get some really terrible political dynamics. And uh, this picture is actually from an article in Splinter News, written by myself and Jesse Myerson, which talks about how the taxpayer money frame has been racialized how it's been uh, used to hurt women and immigrants, especially. You can read more about that online, but it's been covered here, so I'm going to try not to spend too much time on it. The other lie is that banks are just, you know, either making money wildly or they're using our deposits and turning it back around, that the banks rely on us. I would say that the banks are rogue public utilities. They have been chartered by the government, licensed by the government, regulated by the government, and they're out here not doing their job, as Michael said. And so when we talk about pushing them to do particular things, we have to recognize that it's even worse than we thought. They're powerful. They have the money power. They can create and generate credit at the point of, at the point of lending. And they can do a wide variety of other things that are very, very terrible. We can get into that later. If someone in, in, the, in the audience wants to ask me a question about divestment and what MMT means for that in banks, I'd appreciate that because we probably don't have time to get there now. All right. So austerity makes room for financial extraction, as Stephanie said, as Michael said. If the government is not putting money into the economy, the banks are controlling the borrowing process. 
and we're all gonna die if we don't stop it. <coughs> all right, again, been covered. Money doesn't grow on rich people, not on wealthy taxpayers, not on banks. What we want to do is get the money power away from the banks, away from rich people, by making claims on the state. We've got that big, you know, we get that giant piggy bank, call it what you will. Money can come out of the state. Monetary sovereign means that you can spend on people, on planet, on communities. The way that we stake our claim and make the state do that is we establish rights to the things that we want. Then the dynamics for fiscal spending become we pool. We pull money out of state coffers depending on how much we need based on each eligible individual. Instead of waiting for whether it's you know whoever in Congress, rich folks, to write that check. We change the dynamics. You notice Social Security funding. It's met by how many claims there are. It's not met by setting aside a particular amount of money. There's a whole trick that happens with payroll taxes. We've talked about that. Stephanie and Kathleen and Michael talked about that a little bit. But basically, what we're talking about here is that MMT allows activists and people to, once they establish rights, pull money out of the system rather than wait for them to push. So, what does that mean for activists, for organizers, for leftists? Left wing, right wing. Fiscal responsibility, doesn't matter. Stop that. That's for right wing people. This is what matters. We're establishing rights, we're marching for jobs, we're marching for various other freedoms, we want the entitlements. Fiscal austerity is the enemy, even though we might want to be austere towards nature and other you know, sorts of respects. On banking, this is my homie, Sean Sebastian, the leader of Fed Up, right over here, arguing for a more democratic Federal Reserve. This is obviously Rand Paul. They're both fighting the Fed, but for different reasons. This is because of lack of democracy. This is because they're spending too much money. Bad. Good. Bad. Good. <laughs> right. Now, I'm going to go out on a real, um, I think, kind of new limb here, and I'm going to suggest that MMT combined with a new economy focus on environmental sustainability can take us away from the dig derm buff model, the dig burn dump model, and into a plant nurture thrive model. So I already discussed some of this dynamic, but plant, we establish rights, whether it's a right to housing, whether it's a right to jobs, whatever. We free up space to grow, to pool funding, and to have a space, as Pavlina said, outside of the profit motive, even outside of the revenue motive can start to do new things within that space. We fertilize the space with more of that sweet, sweet money for the public government. We can start to heal wounds, try to do things more equitably. People from bad sectors will leave to new jobs and a job guarantee. People from bad buildings will leave to new houses and new, new forms of shelter with the Homes for All movement that's going on, and um, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm just going to um, do a little bit of implementation here and talk about what, how MMT can potentially change things. I think that public money for public purpose is awesome, and that's going to give us a platform to do new things. Eventually, it can, give, it can be public money for public power. We can do even more. And the way that dynamic works is um, by reversing, essentially, the dig, der, dig, burn, dump cycle that we've had been going on here. So because Pavlina already covered work a little bit, I'm not going to talk about it too much. But as you know, you got to serve somebody. You got to get that money, as we talked about. That's the current model. The boss is pretty much in charge. You operate in a profit space or in a local government revenue defined space, for the most part. And then it discards you, and the Fed keeps you there. The job guarantee, <clears throat> differently, we again we plant that seed, we get the right to a job, we create the space. Then we can use more money, we can you know, eventually move on to even stronger things like. Does, are there changing unions? Is there collective bargaining, etc.? People leave spaces that are extractive. No one wants to work for. No one wants to be a part-time prison guard anymore. No one wants to work in fast fashion. No one wants to work in fast food. Not necessarily everybody is going to leave, but it provides people the opportunity to do so. So we can move again towards a regenerative economy, towards people leaving extractive industries. Eventually, you can layer on democratic processes into the job guarantee, into the new space that's been created. Uh, my friend Alexander Kolopetronis, who um, is a political scientist, has written a lot about how participatory budgeting, sortition, and worker co-ops can be folded in the JG. The Levy Institute proposal itself leaves some space for worker co-op development and suggests that it can be contemplated within the next job guarantee movement. These are my friends of the Cooperative Home Care Associates Association. 
Evelina was talking about, you know, how there's all this fear that what are people going to do? People who have no skills can't, like, you know, get jobs, etc. The biggest co-op in the country is not a granola bazaar in San Francisco. It's a bunch of Afro-Latino women in the South Bronx, and they've been doing this for 20 years. A lot of them would be considered low-skilled. They make it work. I think we can all make it work. Just a little bit, two more examples of implementation, and then I'll, I'll, be, I'll be out of here and I'll be trying to do this quickly. Extractive finance and housing, again, dispossessing people, whether that's through the initial, you know, capture of land, etc., whether it's gentrification, and you know, people moving into Queens and Brooklyn, etc. The landlord is in charge, the landlord kicks you out, the landlord doesn't like you, the landlord segregates people, you get redlined, you get gentrified, you get surveilled by all these crazy consumer reporting systems. And then the threat of homelessness keeps you in line. This is true even for the middle class who is in, in thrall to the banks, if not to landlords. With MMT, what does it look like? You establish a right to housing, that not necessarily all MMTers believe in that, but, but I do. The point is that you can establish a right, you create the space. Once it's guaranteed that everyone gets this thing, now you have room to maneuver. The rights pull the money down to tenants. You can have social housing projects, et cetera, et cetera then you can start doing things that are more democratic over time. Community land trusts, mutual housing associations. These things can all be contemplated once we have the funding, the public capital, again, that sweet, sweet fertilizer. These are my friends in um, East Harlem, where New Economy Project is helping to build a uh, community land trust, where you take the land off the market, the residents own it. These things can be helped by MMT. Finally, financial services. So. Um, everybody's familiar with the access to credit narrative. I think that that in and of itself is like a problem that we think that people don't have enough loans. We really want people to get more money. We want people to get money from the state in the form of benefits, we want people to get higher wages, whether it's through a job guarantee program or something else. But in the instance that people need credit, right now they're beset with a bunch of predators, whether that's payday lenders, whether that's banks acting terribly, whether it's this new fintech stuff from online, which actually turns out to be just as predatory as the analog version. Um, but So what you can do with an MMT framework is, again, establish public infrastructure, establish rights. You can do some forms of postal banking. You can do public banking. And then from then on out, um, you know, the threat of you having to go to a payday lender is gone. So you have room to maneuver, again, political room and fiscal room. And you can start doing things like complementary currencies. You can start doing things like public banking. You can start doing all these other more democratic things that we want once the public sector is putting pressure on the private sector and giving civil society room to grow. As you see here, there is a regenerative model for any, all of these things. You just need the public money. This is a picture of my friends in, um, in Brixton, England, who have a complementary currency program. They generate money, or you could say their own forms of IOUs, which they use in the local community so that people only do business with local business. They're keeping what they call clone town London out of there. Brixton Pound, look them up. And these are acceptable in receipt of taxes, which is very interesting for MMTers. This is a credit union that was um, built in the remnants of a bank that was destroyed in the 80s. We worked with them. It's real. You can do this. They had public funding. They had CDFI money from the federal government. We could have many more of those. And finally, Gar mentioned the public banking movement. This Tuesday at noon, New Economy Project and the coalition of other grassroots groups are launching an effort to create one here in New York. And the idea there is that, yes, the public, the public bank will generate credit to lend to democratic enterprises. Ideally, we'd want federal money. Federal money's not coming right now, but this is something that is powerful, that municipalities can do, and in the process, we can highlight a lot of what money really is. It's a public creature that should be used for the public good, and we can do a lot of political education with this, as well as um, deliver real material healing help to organizations throughout New York City. So if you're interested in all that, you can join us at 12 p.m. I'll be there with a megaphone right in front of the New York Stock Exchange. And public money for public power. So, if you, get, if you all don't have questions now, I, I suppose you don't. Uh, let, me, let me just say one thing. I, I'm from Racine, Wisconsin. And I had, I had an aunt who ran a little tiny Jewish bakery. 
and she used to say, you know, during the Depression, there wasn't any money around. And then they decided to run a war, and there's all kinds of money around. Why can't we do that when we want to do that? That is probably the point. So, let's go. Questions starting right there. Oh, okay. <laughs> My name is Joy. I'm here with Real Progressives. A lot of you guys probably know that we're independent media who talks about MMT. Um, I am actually having Congressman Ro Khanna back on my show on Thursday. I wanted to ask Ms. Kelton. Um, I know that the article came out recently about Ro's new FJG plan, and, and you were quoted. I'm just kind of, um, for our viewers who are watching, can you just kind of explain what your thoughts are on that? Because I really, you know, I'm going to discuss it with him for sure on Thursday. Well, let me just say something quickly, just based on the number of hands that shot up by one uh, other people. Yeah. Many. Oh, yeah. so the question, the question the is about a proposal Please. for a jobs program that um, is being introduced by Congressman Rokana, and uh, she was just asking me, there was an article in which I was quoted uh, in part saying something about this proposal. So, look, like Pavlina said, there, uh, this is in the House, there are Senate versions, some are more ambitious than others, some are genuine job guarantee proposals, others are not, while they're oriented around trying to create more jobs, they are uh, dependent upon incentivizing the private sector to try to um, cajole them into you know, hiring more workers. In the case of uh, Congressman Khanna's proposal, uh, that's supposed to be done through subsidized, uh, mostly private employment. So, um, you know, he, he and I uh, have worked together uh, on some things in the past, and I like him very much. Um, it is, what he's putting forward is not a federal job guarantee of the kind that we've been working on and, and pushing for for a lot of years. Uh, Senator Sanders is going to come out with the other end of the spectrum, which is the biggest, boldest um, pro program of them all. Senator Booker and some others are talking about a pilot program. So it's, um, you know, there's a menu of choices out there. Uh, some do what they're advertised uh, as doing, which is guaranteeing employment. That means if you want work and you don't have it, you get to work. You get a job, and you get a job at 15 bucks an hour with benefits. Okay, that's a federal job guarantee. Anything less than that is should really be described as something different. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Hey, let's go to the other side of the room. Um, I'm from I'm Portland, Oregon, and I'm involved in a lot of different organizing causes, and we keep on um, coming up on the stumbling block of whether it's for housing or as a teacher uh, for education funding or for, as a single payer act, um, advocate on a state level, we keep on coming up with the stumbling block of how do we finance things on a state level, right? Because education and even trying to, you know, I don't have hopes that we're gonna create single payer healthcare on the national level with this Congress, but on a state level, we can show that it works and then lead to the national level. But is there a way that we can work with um, having the, the power of the federal government um, with the financing to help the states to do this? Like, is there a way that we could work with the uh, governors throughout the country? Uh, because they would love to not have to deal with um, financing public education. I mean, after Prop 13 and similar kind of measures all over the country, if there is a way that the federal government could um, really help the states with definitely education, but housing, um, even, yeah, all kinds of things. Who would like that one? Who would the microphone? I mean, look, my, my view is that these are public goods and that public goods require public funding. And so you're right back at Raul's sweet, sweet uh, nectar or whatever it was. Uh, it is going to be extremely difficult for states to pony up, if you'll excuse the pun here, uh, for, for funding something like that. Maybe California could do it. Okay, but you saw what happened in Vermont and, and you can imagine, right, what's going to happen, especially as prices escalate and the same thing has happened with college costs and so forth. So I think that, look, overwhelmingly there's support. The public wants uh, single care. I mean, they, they, there's overwhelming support for education too. I prefer to keep fighting for those things to be federally funded rather than to start anticipating or, or pushing for movements to get states to take this on themselves. Way back there. 
Loudly, please. This is for uh, Stephanie. Oh, wait. MMT explains that the government has the China and Russia are uh, borrowing in their own currency. If you borrow in dollars, then uh, you have to hold resolve, uh, dollar reserves, and you have to end up uh, extracting, uh, somehow earning export revenues, uh, and uh, essentially transferring them all in the form of uh, uh, buying dollars. That's what's supporting the dollar today. The dollar is going way up against the Latin American currencies, the third world currencies, uh, because all of a sudden uh, there's been a flight uh, uh, there's a realization that uh, Venezuela and Argentina cannot pay the debts. The debts are, uh, not only are the debts too large, but the foreclosure process uh, that's being run by the uh, predatory uh, 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 hedge funds are uh, stripping the economy and making it look like uh, Greece uh, or Latvia. So uh, what my conclusion from modern, modern monetary theory is it, if we're going to introduce it, it's not going to work until we have a debt write down. And as you know from other talks here, uh, uh, Argentina's and Venezuelan's debt are uh, uh, odious debts. Uh, they shouldn't be taken care of. Uh, the problem is that Venezuela's debt owed in dollars is secured by Venezuela's oil resources. Uh, the dictatorship that America installed in Venezuela by uh, mass target assassination progress had the Venezuelan government promise to uh, securitize its uh, government, uh, its foreign borrowings with its oil reserves. And uh, the oil reserves, there's a massive embezzlement 
uh, from it. Uh, only about 40% of its oil reserves it turned over uh, to the government. Uh, this, is a, 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 this is a political problem that uh, cannot be solved without a debt write down. Uh, and that is a, a, a political conclu conclusion that I draw from modern monetary theory. Let's see. Um, right here. Thank you. Thank you. I, I want
I mean, I try to make that as clear as I can. If I didn't do it, then one of these smarter people can. <laughs> All right, let's go back to this side of the room. Uh, right there. Thank you. Uh, the rights are there. The preamble to the Constitution, the 14th Amendment, 150th anniversary, 14th Amendment, equal protection of the law. So the rights are there. The obstacle is there, too. We have killers, murderers, in charge of the government. Wars, war, murders, murder. They delegated the power to a president, which they're not allowed to do. So how do you eliminate the killers? Because that's the error in your logic. Democracy in this country is based on 50,000 people per representative. How are you going to remove the criminals on the top? I think that I think that one's coming up in the next session. <laughs> uh, I was just going to say I was going to go back to uh, I shared a quote from, from Joe Biden and from some of the people who organized this panel. You know, understanding how the monetary system works does not obviate the need for politics. I, for once, still want to expropriate expropriators, but the point is that you also can grow. You don't just have to spend all your time fighting, and you don't have to try to unclench the hand of the fire sector to give you the money. You know, when you can really just start building as well as fighting. That's all we're saying. Okay, let's see. Way up, way, way, far way up there. First of all, thank you. Louder, please. I see. First of all, thank you to the panelists. I've seen a number, a few of these panels over the years, and this is one of the best ones. So thank you. because they worried that I'd get involved in party discussions. And so they invited Milton Friedman and the Chicago uh, people who uh, convinced uh, uh, Shanghai really to go uh, Thatcherite. Uh, this is spread now to a lot of people uh, in uh, uh, Beijing. So the center of modern monetary theory is now Tianjin. And uh, that's where uh, we're, uh, one uh, Russian, one of my colleagues at uh, Peking University said, Marxism is the Chinese word for politics, uh, not economics. Uh, the, uh, they've uh, followed uh, uh, public ownership. Uh, the advantage of uh, uh, what uh, they've done monetarily is the Bank of China uh, can create enough money uh, to finance uh, industry and capital formation. The advantage of having a public uh, uh, creditor is you can cancel the debts and there's no crisis and nobody's going to overthrow you. Because uh, when uh, uh, a major Chinese uh, important corporation can't pay the debt, the Chinese bank writes it off, and they're writing off debts out of themselves. If they let in private banking, and that's the fight that uh, we were all discussing in uh, Beijing last month, uh, if you let in private banks and you cancel the debts, you'll wipe them out. Uh, and then they'll really fight. Uh, just imagine if uh, uh, the US banks go into China, begin to make loans, to uh, Chinese companies, how do you make loans? You make more reckless loans and easier credit and, uh, uh, than uh, Chinese banks can do. You'll bid, uh, the loans will bid up the price of real estate, increasing the cost of housing. Uh, and then, uh, if China writes them down, the bank, you can imagine, the American branches of uh, the banks in China will go under and you'll wipe out the American banking system. Uh, I thought that if this is their plan, you know, I, I'm all for it. Uh, it's a, no, no, they, they haven't thought of that. Uh, so, uh, again, it's a political discussion of just how you're going to do it. Okay. I'm looking for a, qu a question from Fabian. Anybody got one? Yes. I need some help. 
uh, with the International Trade Education Squad of the Park Slope Food Co-op. And uh, we wanted, we need some help from uh, the brilliance here to uh, link the international trade agreements into this conversation. And I'll be at the door with uh, showing you how you get